Hello guys, thank you for checking out the new episode of the devlog. Last month we talked about the new dialogue system of the game, which is based on JSON files and Unity scriptable objects. And this month it was time for me to take care of some last core game mechanics so that the game is at a level that allows me to add proper game content. And the most important missing part was the game manager. So what is the game manager and why is it so important and special? Over the last few months I've been working on game elements that are important within a single scene, like pathfinding and camera movement for example. A single scene in Unity consists of multiple game objects, which contain so-called components. A game object can for example be set up to be a background image, a particle effect or some UI element. Or it just holds a mono behavior script like the timeline script from last episode. So within a scene everything can be neatly organized by these game objects. But when the scene is changed, all game objects from the old scene are getting destroyed, along with all the components, and the new scene is loaded with all the new game objects. This makes perfect sense most of the time, because we don't need the background image from scene 1 in scene 2, but there are also elements that we always need, no matter what scene we are in. For example, the pause menu, or other UI elements that are always visible, like the cursor. But also scripts that are responsible for things like the player input or audio output. Therefore for some game objects it makes sense to not destroy them and carry them over from one scene to another. This is super simple to set up by just typing this single line of code into any script that lives on the game object. But it can quickly lead to a really big mess if you're not careful. Because suddenly there are several objects in a scene which are supposed to do the same thing. This inevitably leads to bugs and puts a high load on the memory. So it makes sense to keep all the elements that won't be destroyed and should be carried over from scene to scene well organized. And that's where the game manager comes in. The game manager is my top game object and is the parent of all child game objects that are important for every scene and should not be destroyed. Therefore I only have to tell the game manager to not be destroyed and all the child game objects will remain too. I'll go through all these individual parts with you later in the video, but first let's address the mentioned problem where we have the same game object and script twice. For example if we start in scene 1, which consists of all the scene elements and the game manager, and we switch to scene 2 and take the game manager with us, everything is still okay. But as soon as we switch back to scene 1, there is a second game manager and we run into problems. That's why it makes sense to make the game manager a singleton and to make sure that there's only ever one instance of it. I've seen different syntax for this, but I'm currently using this one. Basically it works like this. In the awake function, directly at the beginning of the script, it is checked if there's already an instance of this script. If not, then this script takes over the role of the instance. Otherwise, it destroys itself. In the example from before, it would look like this. In scene 1, the game manager wakes up and checks if there's already an instance of the game manager. No, so it takes over the role. The change to scene 2 is unproblematic because there's no game manager here. Back in scene 1, however, a second game manager wakes up and looks to see if there's already another game manager. Since the role has already been taken over, the game object destroys itself. This ensures that there's always only one game manager instance. In my workflow, every scene consists of three basic layers. First, game manager, with all child game objects which are never destroyed and always exist only once per scene. Second, scene controller, which contains all the elements that make up a specific scene, backgrounds, objects, NPCs, doorways and so on. And third, the player game object, which is responsible for things like all the character animations and so on. We covered most of the scripts that make up the player game object as well as the scene specific elements in episode 1, 2 and 3 of the devlog. So let's wrap up this devlog by taking a closer look at some game objects and scripts that make up the game manager. So first there is a game manager script itself, which is not doing very much on its own, but it is containing the code that is responsible for all this singleton and not destroying stuff we just talked about. And it is holding references to some other important scripts that live somewhere on or on a child of this game object. This makes it super easy to navigate to a specific script. Let me show you what I mean by this. Here for example is a script called game state and the game manager script is holding a reference to it. I use the game state script to keep track of what is currently happening in the game. Things like are we in a cutscene or in a dialogue, is the inventory open or are we in a pause menu and things like that. Now let's say we want to change the game state, for example when we start a dialogue. Since the game manager is a singleton, I can access it from any script within a scene by simply typing game manager.instance, because we know there only exists one instance of this. So it is super easy to access the game state script too. Game manager .instance, and we type .game state. And now we access the game state script and can call a function on it. 
And this is exactly how all other elements of the game manager are structured. For example, the UI itself consists of many subcategories, such as dialog lines, hotspot icons, transitions, menus and cursor. So if I want to hide the cursor manually, for example, I can access the cursor script from anywhere by typing gamemanager.instance.ui.cursorManager. Besides the game state and all the UI elements, the game manager also takes care of inventory and memory. These scripts keep track of what items have already been picked up or used and what information the player already has and things like that. The custom input manager is responsible for handling the player input and switching between different control types like keyboard, mouse and gamepad. The audio manager is not ready yet, but it will handle the communication between Unity and the audio software of my choice, FMOD. The save and load manager is quite self-explanatory responsible for saving and loading the game on whatever device you are playing the game on. The localization manager is something I worked on quite a while in the last weeks. It is a custom localization tool to be able to release the game in multiple languages later. And the last game object in here is the achievement manager, which will be responsible for handling the Steam achievements. Most of this stuff is already working and I guess I need to put one or two more weeks of work into these core game mechanics until we can start filling the game with actual game content. So far we've done a lot of coding, but starting with the upcoming devlog we'll be working more on graphics, animations, sound, music, story, dialogues and puzzles and I'm really looking forward to it. Please don't forget to wishlist A Pretty Broken Adventure on Steam and thank you so much for your support. See you on October 1st.